Well, Tony and I agreed a lot about a lot of things. We agreed particularly about education. Tony and I were devoted to comprehensive education and proper comprehensive education. So we agreed about that. I remember very kindly Tony wrote a sort of obituary of me for some education magazine when I gave up, left the house, saying some members of parliament were wind vanes and some were signposts. And what he liked about Roy Hatter was that I was a signpost, which I thought was a great compliment. But I have to say, Tony was a terribly destructive member of the Labour Party. I mean, Tony was not a team player. Tony was, well, not for Tony, but for Tony's own ideas. And therefore it was very difficult to get on with Tony when you got a crisis on your hands, you needed to pull together all on the same side. Tony would go off on a tangent. But one of the great virtues of Tony is he had a sense of humour. Uh, I remember in the cabinet one day, well, the IMF crisis, cutting down money, going around the table, who can, who can sacrifice most money, got to Tony. Tony said, these problems will never be solved until we have a genuine socialist economy. And Jim Callan said, that's not a contribution to this debate, that's just a statement of socialist principle. And Tony said, I plead guilty and ask for another 50,000 cases to be taken into consideration. We, we all burst out laughing, it broke the tension. And Tony was like that, Tony was bright in his way. But my great hero and friend Tony Crossland, who taught him at Oxford, used to say to me that Tony's fine, except he's a bit cracked. <laughs> and we had these strange eccentricities. I mean, you know, when we went to, into his office in the Ministry of Fuel and Ministry of Energy, he had a map of England upside down on the wall to prove that you could have a, I don't, I'm not sure what he had to prove, but it was proving something. And he had that sort of strange attitude to many things. And he was also very much prepared to undermine his colleagues. Um, when Dennis ran for deputy leader, and he was the deputy candidate too, he behaved very badly, very badly indeed. Well, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what, I mean, Dennis was candidate for deputy leader, and wherever he went, he was shouted down. Led by a man called Landsman, who we know hear about now. And Dennis said to me, you get on with Tony Ben, you share his views on public expenditure, you share his views on education, you share his views on lots of dramatic things. Go and tell him to call off the mob. So I went to see Tony and said, Tony, Dennis gets shouted down wherever he gets, for God's sake, tell your supporters to shut up. And he said, oh, you can't ask me to do that. I don't tell good comrades what to do, they make up their own minds. Now, he could have stopped it at the drop of a hat, but he cho chose not to. But Dennis Healy, comes in the special category of being the cleverest man I've ever met. I've met a lot of clever men, but Dennis was so intellectually brilliant that it was stunning. He was also a marvellous boss. My first big job was called Minister of Defence, which was the second job in the Ministry of Defence and with cabinet rank. Dennis was my boss. And he was marvellous. I mean, um, he supported me in public, whatever I did, right or wrong. When he made it, when I mistake privately, he played her with me, shouted at me in two letter, three letter words. But he was a perfect boss to work for. And partly because he always had a grasp of things. And I remember when he, we lost the election, there was a party at the Ministry of Defence with the Air Chief Marshal Elworth, the Chief of the Defence Staff, saying in a valedictory speech, Dennis Healy was the greatest Secretary of Defence we ever had. He changed defence policy. Tripwire which meant that if one Russian tank went over the boundary, we destroyed Russia, we demolished, and Dennis put in its place limited response. And he had the major thoughts on how to change defence policy. And that was a great achievement. And he was a good, he was a good chancellor. And he would have been a great leader of the Labour Party. Had he won against Michael Foote, uh, I'm not sure he would have won the election, but he was damn near close to it. Well, the gang of four were all friends of mine. I've been on holiday with every one of them. <laughs> um, but they never approached me about joining. I mean, I, the story was we were going to the Shadow Cabinet and Eric Heffer came up to me and said, you've written this bloody piece for The Guardian about leaving the Labour Party if you don't agree with Europe. And I said, no, I haven't. He said, yes, you're the Guardian writer in the Cabinet. You're the you're a column in The Guardian. And we know it's coming out of The Guardian. They've told us about it and you're too responsible. So I thought it was Eric going off his head. At the end of the Cabinet meeting, D David Owen came up to me and said, David Owen came up to me and said, uh, I'll tell you what he's on about. Three of us have written a piece for The Guardian, which is in support of the European Union. And we thought of asking you to join, but surely, Shirley Williams said he won't agree with the last paragraph, because the last paragraph is, if they don't get it right, we'll leave the Labour Party. And he, you, so we didn't even mention you. And that is the only time I had a conversation with a gang of four about their behaviour. They never approached me, they never suggested I should leave. 
And I, I mean, I'm quite right. I never contemplate. I mean, do I fly to the moon on my own wings? I mean, I just never thought about it. David Owen's still a friend of mine. I mean, David Owen is more Labour than half of the Labour Party. Yeah. Uh, but he has these quirky ideas. David Owen had the idea that David Owen is always right, which is a very dangerous, dangerous political position. Well, I, I think he was a very good Deputy Prime Minister. Um, uh, and I'll tell you exactly why. Um, nearly all the deputies, prime ministers, deputy leaders, uh, if you go through them, Morrison, Bavan, Brown, Jenkins, Healy, me, were all failed leaders. We were all people who thought we ought to be leader and we did the deputy job as a consolation. John thought the deputy's job was a good thing in itself and therefore made a job out of it. So I think John was a very good, perhaps the best deputy leader we've ever had, uh, because he made the deputy leader's job something other than the consolation prize.